I'm the MC as we go, and I'll keep everything short, and this will not come off of anybody's 18 minutes, just I know you were worried about that. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you my boss. Now, I'm going to say a lot of flowing things because we're doing, you know, we're coming to that staff evaluation time. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Brian has been here for how many years? 19 years here. Before that, he was over at the Naval Academy. He's never coached rowing at all. However, he was... Uh, how many years at the Naval Academy? Twelve. Twelve years there. Coach of the year for Division One, and in the sport of lacrosse. Coached here, and now he's been the athletic director since that time. And over the years, I've been at four other institutions, and I've met a lot of athletic directors. I will say this: has more knowledge of the sport of rowing. Has spoken at a lot of conferences um, about uh, U.S. rowing conferences, but has more knowledge about rowing than than any other athletic director that I've ever met. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Brian Matthews. Thank you, Mike. Welcome, and it's great to have you here this morning. Uh, Willie, we could have a problem because I tweeted all of my people on the way in, so I know you're going to be flooded with, with it all coming in. Tweeting. Uh, <laughs> so uh, when Mike asked me to speak, if, if I would like to speak, uh, I right away said yes because I've been part of this since it started and enjoy it a lot. And then I had to think a little bit about what, you know, what value could I add here this morning. Certainly can't help you as a rowing coach, make your boats go faster. Um, anything along those lines, wouldn't want to try. It's not, don't know. Um, so then I thought a little bit, okay, how about just as coaches? Um, how many of you remember 1977? Uh, unfortunately, only you know a few. Uh, we've had more birthdays than the others in the room. The reason why I asked that date, that was the first year I started as a college assistant coach. Um, and it was here at Washington College in the sport of lacrosse. And I remember distinctly that first year, a couple of the old timers taking me aside and saying, I'm sure glad I'm not starting to coach now. Why? Uh, because it's a lot harder than it used to be. It's not fun. They went through all the reasons. And my guess is 30 years from now, um, some of you will be saying to people that are just starting out, I'm glad I'm not in your shoes because it's so much tougher now than it used to be. But so my, my subject this morning is a few headlines about how do we survive and enjoy coaching today. Keyword there, enjoy. Um, how do we do it? Um, yes, coach, it, it has changed, no question. The concerns those guys had in 1977 aren't really the same necessarily as our concerns now. Um, sure, um, are the people we coach different in some ways? Of course, because their culture, their society, their upbringing is different. Um, we'll go through a lot of things that have changed a lot, but certainly things that weren't around, email, texting, cell phones, blogs, internet, all things that as a coach can impact on your ability to enjoy your job, certainly. But let's talk a little bit about what are the things that are still there to help us enjoy coaching, things that I don't think have changed at all. It allows you to stay a part of a sport you love, allows you to give back to a sport that you obviously love or you wouldn't be doing it. It allows you to help others learn to love the sport that you love, to introduce it to them. It enables you to help them improve their skills in this sport and get better at it and maybe excel. Um, practice. Practice always was fun and it still is fun. Going to practice and helping people, teaching. You're teaching and you're helping people get better. Competition. If we didn't like competition, we wouldn't be sitting in this room. It's a thrill, it's a rush, that's not, hadn't changed, isn't going to change. Um, lifelong friends, no doubt about it, some of the people you've coached, some of the people you coach with are your best friends and will be for life. Those things haven't changed and I don't think they're going to change. So those are all reasons to still enjoy coaching. That's the easy part, that's the obvious part. You didn't need, to, need me to stand up here and talk about that. Let's talk about some of the challenges of surviving and enjoying coaching. And uh, un unfortunately, some of this is kind of obvious too. Parents. You know, that wasn't in 1977 when those guys said to me, that they didn't say that. 
That wasn't one of their, their points. It was kids aren't as tough as they used to be. It's harder to coach kids. Now that seems kind of simple compared to our list of what we talk about today. Sense of entitlement, attitudes, expectations, liability issues, legal issues, social media and communication. Most of those things are kind of, they're not brand new, but they're relevant now today to us. So what can you do about it? Again, those are fairly obvious. You don't need me to stand here and tell you about those things. What can we try to do about it as coaches? Well, I would say as we all tell our athletes, no matter what the sport is, focus on the things you can control. So let's try to manage our professional journey as a coach. First, with that, for me, is plan. And when you say that is we have lots of assistant coaches that come through at the college level. And one of the things I like to do with all of them is ask them, what's your plan? Just like when you do it with an undergraduate, when you say that to an undergraduate, deer in headlights, glaze comes over. It's not, so, it's not a skill that we do a very good job of teaching people either in K through 12 or in higher ed, how to plan, how to plan for yourself. So when you ask them, well, what's your next step? Don't know. Well, where do you want to be in five years? Then it gets really hard. What's your dream job? Now we've gotten bigger real hard. So I would encourage coaches, and, and this certainly is not the sport of rowing. This is all of us. In the, it, it has always kind of surprised me in the profession of coaching how little career planning, professional planning, people do. We tend to go by what's the next job that's available, what's in the market. When I ask our assistant coaches who have to leave because they can't afford to stay here after a couple of years, so they're going to look for another job, what are you going to do? Well, I'll see what's out there. Hmm. Is, is that you controlling your professional career or letting the next job that's open do that to you? When I say to them, first of all, do you want to stay in coaching? I mean, to me, that's, as a coach, that's sort of the, the biggest decision. Once we make that, m many of them say, yes, I love it. Okay? What? What do you want to do? First of all, in most of our sports, at what level? College, high school, in, in your case, a club is, is bit huge. Um, but what do I want to do? Let's make that decision. Uh, if it's college, do I want to be a head coach? For many people, if I'm going to stay in it long term, yes, eventually. Division one, division two, II, division three. The reason why, to me, those are very important questions is because if this is your goal, and this is what you want to do, then your decisions of not only what path to take, but what steps to take along that path are absolutely critical to whether or not you'll get to where you want to go. If, if I want to be a Division I head rowing coach, I better not have my next job being a high school coach because that's not where athletic directors are going to hire their next coach from. For that matter, if I want to be a Division I head coach, I better not have my next job be another Division III job because that's not likely where that athletic director is going to hire that next Division I coach from. It's going to come from somewhere down the line of Division I assistant coaches. And for ours, at 25 years old, used to making no money here, they can go be a volunteer and make about the same amount of money that they make here and be on the path towards where they want to go. But taking time to plan, reflect on where I want to go and determine my decisions, my professional decisions myself, not just what the market bears, I, I think is critical towards future enjoyment of where you end up. Taking advantage of professional development opportunities. And, and we see it here. I have some assistant coaches Allison's a great example who takes advantage of every opportunity out there. Volunteers for projects becomes part of the solution within our department. Uh, some coaches go to as many uh, professional development opportunities as they have, like this right here. But think of all the rowing coaches that aren't here, that aren't doing what you're doing right now. Um, 
read, find mentors. In this business, find mentors. Establish yourself as a leader. And when I say that, as we know, that's within your world. Your world may be your high school. It may be your college, athletic department. It may be simply within your rowing staff of wherever you are. Is I believe in this business, if you want to grow, progress, move towards new opportunities, you need to be one of those who steps up and uh, is not afraid to be a leader. We're in a leadership business here coaching. Um, so at some point, you step up and look for those opportunities as much as possible. And I'm, I'm a big, big believer that one of those is really about volunteering. Who raises their hands? Whether it's for a volunteer job, but more often, no. It's, we, we all have problems every day. We're problem solvers. It's what coaches are. It's what coaching staffs are all the time. So we all have new challenges all the time. So who's the one that when collectively as a problem-solving team, whatever that is, whether it's two people or 50 people in our staff, our athletic department staff, and we've got a challenge and we're looking for volunteers and, and most of the heads go like this because their first thought is, I don't want any more work. I'm busy. I don't want work. And then you have a few people who are, count me in. I'm in. I would argue that those are the people that will be happiest in that profession because doors will open. They'll be the luckiest. They'll be the ones we'll all be saying, hmm, she was really lucky to get that job. I don't know how she did it, but she was lucky. She's got a great job, and she's lucky to have that job. Yeah, we all know. You're in athletics. You, you earn your luck. You, know, you work for it. Let's go to the next step. Uh, rowers and parents. You know, in terms of uh, trying to survive and enjoy our profession. You work with rowers, and, and I, I'm used to, in your sport, that could be five-year-olds up to 95-year-olds, which is very different than most other sports. Uh, you have such a diverse demographic in, in your, your sport. Um, but they're all rowers. And other than the 95-year-olds, most of them have parents still that, that you probably deal with and work with. Uh, one thing I was told a long time ago, and I wish I was told it earlier on in my coaching career, is they don't care what you know till they know that you care. And I think in our business, that one, you can't get much more important than that. Um, and I believe that's true certainly for your athletes, no matter what age. But I think it's also true for their parents. Um, so when we're trying to manage that part of it, which, as we know, can be very challenging. No, second piece is, hope is not a strategy. They won't go away. So if you're waiting for that to happen, hoping for that to happen, it's not going to happen. I would also argue they're probably not going to change much, at least for the better. Um, at least not without help. Uh, let's talk about managing expectations. I think it's pretty important, both on your athlete side, uh, but certainly on your parent's side, is uh, communicating what are the goals? What are we trying to accomplish here? Clarifying objectives, communicating the plan. What is the plan for our organization, whether it's a club team of eight-year-olds, whether it's an adult of 60-year-olds, uh, high school, college? What's our plan? What's our objective here, and how do we plan to get there? The, the more you can clearly communicate that, I think the more you help yourself. Establishing standards and enforcing them. Team rules, tryouts. Who's in a boat, who isn't, and why, and how that's determined. You know, who, who, who is in it and who isn't, and who's in the spot they're going to be in in your sport seems to matter to people a little bit, and, and why they're there, and how that was determined. You know, in all of our sports, it seems to work that those conversations happen so much better before a season starts, before people get emotionally very involved, before we're, we're in mid-season and my son isn't in the boat he should be in, and I want to know why. And he's not in the seat he should be in, and I know because I've watched rowing for 10 years. I've gone to all his rowing events. I know where he should be sitting and why isn't he. 
those kind of conversations, clarifying how it's determined, who's in charge of doing that, what that process is, works a lot better in your sport, I think, in January and February than having those conversations in April and May. And I think that's true for all sports. Before the emotions get real involved. And every parent and, and every athlete is pretty sure they're great at handling all this before the season starts. So when you have conversations about what the rules are, they can all accept them then before everything gets, gets down the road creating boundaries along those same lines for you to control what are the boundaries where are the lines drawn can they can a parent call you anytime day or night because if you don't set that boundary they certainly think they can no question you're coaching my kids so if I want to call you at 12 o'clock at night on a Friday night after a few martinis I don't see the problem in that unless you've established what the boundaries are how about can they call and discuss anything they want? Why my kid isn't in the boat she should be in? Why she isn't sitting in the seat she is? You don't understand. You're costing me a scholarship. If you would just get it together and figure things out the way I have, we'd all be okay. But if you establish those boundaries long beforehand that that's not appropriate and that's not acceptable and not going to be tolerated. But have those conversations real early on. Now, safety and health issues, another, another question. So when I get a call late at night from a parent, but it's because she's very concerned about a significant, legitimate health concern of their child, I want to hear that. I want to know that one. That's, that's perfectly appropriate. A lot, I think a lot of this, we're, part of our job is educating parents on what's the right way to be a parent of an athlete on your team because why should we assume they know how to do it right and we've had plenty of evidence that most of them don't we don't teach that where's that class offered so you have the opportunity as the leader of your organization how about addressing the perception gap what's real what's realistic not everybody's great not everybody's the same not everybody's getting a college scholarship and I have one for you just learned this at the NCA last week the average athletic scholarship in all of America for all sports is $8,000. That's including football and basketball that are all full scholarships. If you took those out, how low would that number be? Make your sport safe. Risk management, be good at it and document all of this. Rules, alcohol, drugs, training rules, make all those things, be good at that. Create a safe environment, which means make sure you have covered sexual harassment, hazing, bullying, alcohol and drugs, and document it. Those are things to protect yourself. So we're back to surviving. Make it fun. My favorite, John Wooden. I wish I had read this one as a 25-year-old head coach. Success is the peace of mind, which is a direct result of the self-satisfaction in knowing you made the effort to become the best of which you are capable. I wish I had learned that one and taken that to heart as a young coach. Manage your brand. In this day and age, manage your brand has to do with websites, blogs, your communication, the quality of it, what it looks like. It matters now, much more than it used to. Last thing, my favorite John Wooden. Don't whine, don't complain, don't make excuses. Be true to yourself. Thank you. I hope you enjoy your coaching career for a long time. Thank you. your boss he's got to get off the stage I think that's pretty <laughs> gutsy so how about three minutes for questions and here's a chance for you whether you're and I would say half of you right now we know uh, have other jobs full-time jobs and you just stick rowing in there you just coach as part of whatever you do on the outside but you have another full-time career but some of you this is just you're cutting your teeth you're just getting into it. good time to ask a question for an, from an AD Anything you'd want to know, especially someone who's been around a long time in the sport of coaching or the realm of coaching. Do you set as a policy your drug and alcohol policy as a school and then it's disseminated to the coaches? Because what we've been told is be very careful of the policy that you create because you will have to defend it. 
to answer your question, yes, we do. We start with the colleges, and we don't change that because that's our backup all the way. Then within the athletic department, we would never take anything, subtract anything from that. So if we're going to do anything, we would only add it, and it would be primarily for safety and well-being reasons. For example, the college's policy doesn't really address the fact that you put people in a boat and you get their heart rates up to whatever it is you get it up to, but it's a lot. Um, and to me, that makes a difference in, in our policy. For example, the college doesn't have any kind of a 48-hour rule about anything. And to you all, it matters to you what that athlete was doing last night uh, when you're putting them in a boat and getting their heart rate way up. And the worst case scenario happens, and you had no rules about it. It was okay. You know, coach had no rules. I could go to that party the night before and do however many shots kids do these days and get in a boat because you happen to have an early morning practice that day. And it's all the things. So to answer your question, yes, we do. Um, I, I don't want my coaches to be out of line having to set that policy. I think that's our job. Um, when we start with the schools, though. Yes? Yeah, you know, as a dinosaur, I'm lucky. I got out of coaching in 1994. I didn't really have to worry about what blogs were saying about me, what the internet was saying about me. Um, what uh, Facebook was saying about me, um, or what I was putting out there that gets used against me. So my point is now, I think coaches need to be very careful about all that, be good at it, however you do it. I don't tweet, so I don't have to be good at tweeting, but I send a million emails all the time. I better make sure they are appropriate, that, every, that I realize that every email I same, send is the same as a billboard. It might as well just be up there every single one. So whenever I get a controversial or very touchy email to me, I won't respond to that in an email. That's going to be a phone call or a personal one. I'm not writing back the one that's going to get forwarded to 7,000 people because somebody gets a hold of it and doesn't like it. Um, you know, uh, the whole world of Facebook. So I think our image and our brand is so different. When I was coaching at the Naval Academy, my image and brand was what Joe Gross what wrote in the Annapolis paper every week about whether he liked the way I coached games or not, you know, and whether or not we beat Army or not. So whoever had a pr subscription to that, you know, that was pretty much my brand. Now you, your, your brand is worldwide from here today. So I think it's a whole different world, and we don't have a choice. You have to be good at it, even if you keep it simple. Hello, but you need to be good at it. How could they get a hold of you if, some, if it, somebody had a question they wanted to ask you? Um, only if it's a nice question. Otherwise, you can't get a hold of I mean, it's impossible. Um, e email is a great way. Um, bmatthews2 at washcall.edu. That's all of our, our email. bmatthews2 at washcall.edu. Um, be glad to try to answer or help. Uh, with anything, whether it's a coaching question, a career path to question, college stuff, how we do it, whatever it is. Thanks, boss. Appreciate it greatly. Uh, four minutes, and we'll have our next speaker.